So good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world, you're very welcome to this webinar organised by the World Business Council for Sustainable Development as part of our virtual uh, event series. Uh, today we're going to be looking at sustainability in the finance sector, in particular mobilisation of capital for a resilient world. Wherever you are in the world, I hope that you and your family and loved ones are safe and that the current situation uh, with COVID-19 is something that you are managing to deal with. It has been an unprecedented few weeks, but um, we will get through it and we hope to get through it and be a more sustainable uh, world as a result. In the next slides, I'll be able to introduce you to um, your hosts and to the speakers for today. So my name is Rodney Irwin. I'm the Managing Director of WBCSD's Redefining Value Programme. And together with my colleague Yi Sun in the RV team, we will be your hosts for this afternoon. But we're also delighted to welcome um, a very important uh, group of, of members and, and partners who uh, will provide some expert insights into what we're currently experiencing, particularly around the impacts that COVID-19 has had on the, um, the investments that many of our members uh, have. So the moderator today will be Diane Strauss from the Yale Initiative on Sustainable Finance. So very grateful for Yale and for Diane to give their time today. And we have, as you see here, a number of experts. So Herb, John, Jose Luis and Matt, all will bring different perspectives, whether as an issuer of, of, of um, capital or investors that offer capital or advisory services. As part of the WBCSD's uh, meetings, it's important that we respect antitrust uh, statements. And so um, there, will, there will be today a focus on, on anti antitrust uh, to remind you that any discussion um, or any conversations that could be considered to be um, sensitive, such as pricing, bidding strategies, future capacity additions or reductions, any conversations around customers or output decisions should be avoided at all costs. With respect to housekeeping, this is being recorded and you can use the chat function to interact with us. And you can raise also um, the, your hand in the chat function if you would like to speak and we can unmute you. So we want this to be as interactive as possible. So please make sure that you, if you have a question, no matter um, what it is, please feel free to either use the chat function or, or ask to be able to speak and we will make that happen. So on today's agenda, um, given that approximately two thirds of today's participants are not uh, WBCSD members, we'll give you a quick introduction to WBCSD and the Redefining Value Programme. And then hand on to my colleague Yee, we will look at the impact of COVID-19 on our members and particularly the impact that it's had on stock variation and on the way in which the compliance activities such as AGMs are, are operating at this point in time. But the main focus of today is our panel discussion, which will look at finance and investment dynamics in COVID-19. And of course, this says here to be followed by Q&A, but as I've already mentioned, do feel free to, um, to interrupt at any time with any questions that you may have. We'll be keeping a close eye out for it. So the WBCSD is celebrating its 25th anniversary this year. And um, we are, we are proud to have been working with many businesses over the last 25 years to uh, inspire them and to co-create with them many business solutions that are today used in businesses as they navigate the ever complex world of sustainable development. We represent 200 of the world's global and, and large household name companies and we're yet united around a common vision and that is creating a world in where nine plus billion people will all live well within the boundaries of the planet by 2050. Our membership are who make us uh, credible. And here you see the, 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 the logos and the, the names of our membership. Um, and many of them will be familiar to you. And hopefully some of you will even be on the call today. In our journey towards making the world uh, a more sustainable place and obviously having nine plus billion people living well, we need to see systemic change within within the economy and at WBCSD we have six programs that seek to uh, drive transformation in six economic systems. Our work in circular economy also includes our work in, 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 um, in plastics um, is, is important. 
our work on food and nature is looking at um, the uh, opportunities that we have to feed uh, a growing population and do so in a responsible way. Cities and mobility is how we're going to live and work and play together as we see the growth in cities uh, as well as how do we move people from A to B. Our people programme will look at um, the, the future of work and the implications of technology. We're going to look here at inequalities because we see that also being a significant issue as well as helping businesses with the uh, sustainable development agenda and embracing the opportunities presented by the sustainable development goals and of course our work on climate and energy um, with our ambition to net zero um, is it speaks for itself and here we're working with many companies as they transition to a low carbon economy uh, by addressing both physical and transition risks and working uh, to represent business with policy makers to enable the transition. The work that I lead is part of what we call redefining value which is seeking to help businesses um, professionalize their interrelationships with the data that sustainability creates to in, use that data to create more um, sustainable outcomes and decision making and to professionalize and develop purpose-driven disclosures that will ultimately influence the investment capital um, allocations as well. So that's the WBCSD in a nutshell. So this meeting is part of, of a series of meetings that we have organised given that COVID-19 and the global reaction to the, um, to the virus has resulted in, in all physical meetings more or less being cancelled. And so to continue to engage with you, our members and with the wider community, um, we have been offering, we have been offering these uh, virtual meetings since early April and will continue to do so through until July. There are two sessions. Uh, twice a week and uh, today's sessions as we've said are focusing on the capital markets and our ambition with these sessions are to bring you expertise hopefully inspire you um, and to create exchanges across the WBCSD community and you can find on the website uh, the link here uh, previous uh, meetings as well as the recording of this which will be up in, within a few days next slide please so as this is an interactive session, we're going to be using Menti. I'm sure it's familiar to many of you, but if not, can I ask you to get an internet enabled device such as a mobile phone, your computer or an iPad or some other device and type in www.menti.com in the URL. So when you get there, you'll be asked to input a code and today's code is 670999. So 670999. And there you'll be given an opportunity to vote on a question. And we would love you to do that. So it's always good to know who you're talking to in terms of what sort of roles people have. And as one would expect at a WBCSD webinar, that uh, quite a few of you will be in the sustainable development space within business sustainability departments. Uh, we have a few bankers and then we have a few others. And I would love to know what the others do. So if you are feeling up to it, maybe you could use the chat function just to type in the, the, the area of work that you, you, you're, you're looking at. This allows us to understand who's here, but also allows the panel to see who's in the room in terms of job function and to hopefully address um, all functions so that it can make it meaningful for you. So still a few more of you to go there, but as one would expect, um, a dominance here of people from the business sustainability community. No matter where you work though, you're all welcome and so we're delighted to have you. So I mentioned earlier that at WBCSD I look after a, a, a program of work which we call Redefining Value. And if we go to the next slide, this slide just really summarizes what redefining value tries to do. Uh, what, this is, what this diagram shows is that there is a disconnect between what we today call the financial system and what the sustainable development system does. It's sometimes called non-financial, it's sometimes called extra-financial, particularly in French-speaking countries, but whatever we're calling it, 
the work that sustainability professionals do and the work that the capital markets do are disconnected. However, I think what we're going to hopefully see as a result of this current crisis is that calling this the non-financial may no longer be appropriate. Because at the very heart of COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2 is a social issue that has its origins in the natural world. So technically, it's non-financial, but for anybody that's lost their job, for any finance director or investor relations manager who has seen the value of their shares plummet by 40%, for anybody that's managing a, a pension scheme, uh, particularly a defined benefit pension scheme, they're seeing some significant issues coming their way with respect to what it is has happened. So are we really talking about non-financial? And is this disconnect really as big as we believe, uh, as we think it is? I would guess that in the new normal or whatever it is we return to, we will start to see that non-financial is actually financial. It can have significant and material consequences if we do not address it. And that's what redefining value has been attempting to do over the last seven years. Our focus has been on trying to um, provide the signals from the, what we call the, the non-financial to the financial and vice versa. And at the end of the day, within the programme, the mission has been to make more well-run companies make better decisions by having information internally that is reliable, timely, and all of the things that we take for granted with financial information, have that information packaged so that those discharged with making decisions are able to act upon this information and then disclose that information in the most appropriate and meaningful way so that the actors within the capital markets and those that make decisions on the allocation of financial capital can do so such that more sustainable businesses become more uh, attractive, attracting potentially a lower cost of capital, but also having a, a more risky, a risk-less uh, flow of capital going their way. So at the heart of all of this is, is information. Up until now, we've been working on a number of different projects. And today we're really going to focus a bit on the investor decision-making piece and the external disclosure piece. But I wanted to say before we move off this slide that external disclosure is, should only be the, um, the end result of what the company does internally. Today, too many companies are disclosing information that they don't actually use to manage the business. And we need to get away from that, that, that obsession with external gratification when it's not used to run the business. So today we're going to be talking with business communities that actually produce root information that are trying to inf you know, get the investment community to differentiate them from their peers because they're doing a great job in sustainable development. And we're going to be listening to investors and asking them, what information do you need to be able to do that? But remember, that is part of the end of the chain. The start of the chain is about having good risk management practices in place. It's about having appropriate governance and internal control mechanisms in place. And it's about having decision useful information that decision makers can rely upon. Once you've got that in place, then disclosure should become more meaningful. It should be more purpose driven. And Hopefully, if that chain falls through, we then have investors using that information and directing capital to those. Rothney, we can't hear you. you're on mute. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, we lost about 30 seconds. We probably didn't lose an awful lot, so I'll just try and recap. Um, just saying again that our, our focus here is on, today will be on the, the, the information flows between investors and between uh, the company, and we'll, cover some, we'll focus on that conversation. However, remember that reporting is the end result of what you do inside the company. And so the work that we've done in risk management, governance, et cetera, is all very important, but will not necessarily be the focus of today. 
There are other webinars coming up in the next two weeks that will address those issues. So next slide, please. So before I hand over to Yi, just wanted to draw your attention to some resources that you may want to, to draw upon after this webinar is completed. Um, the first is our work that we've done on purpose-driven disclosure. The ESG Disclosure Handbook is now out there, as well as the Library of Indicators, and together they will help businesses understand how to go about communicating their, uh, their uh, performance, particularly to an investor audience. And we're working on a new project called Building Bridges, which will seek to enhance the conversations between the preparers and the users of this ESG information. And in this respect, the users of the information are the investment community. So coming soon, you will see that um, we'll start to be producing some thought leadership as well as working groups for our members to get involved in. The Building Bridges project funded as part of the Gordon and Betty Moore work on the uh, conservation and, fin and financial markets initiative um, is starting to gather pace. We're also pleased to, to announce that we are in advanced conversations with PRI um, to uh, develop an MOU and to create um, processes and, and, and opportunities for issuers and for investors to have conversations around this. And of course, um, as, as many organisations are, WBCSD is also responding to the COVID-19 crisis. And in particular, we're looking at how during the crisis we can facilitate conversations with um, uh, companies and with investors as companies start to communicate towards um, uh, resilience and uh, differentiation. Um, and as part of that, uh, part of our, our project work, we will be uh, launching this week already uh, a, a webinar that is hosted by PRI that we will attend. That will happen on the 14th. And finally, um, the, the work that we've been doing up until now on ESG um, within the pension uh, scheme at work or in the retirement asset work, um, it, both of these uh, toolkits are, have been available now for over a year and the project as it's officially um, been run will come to a conclusion at the end of this month. But I would like to thank therefore an Alliance Black Rock, Legal and General, Mercer, Natixis and PRI for working with us over the last two years on the development of these toolkits and, and on the working group of 35 companies that have embedded these toolkits into their retirement asset planning. So thank you guys for all that you've done over the last two years. So, one more Menti question. So to help us help you, what are the types of resources that you would expect to receive from the WBCSD going forward that will help with corporate investor dialogues? So here you've, um, this is really for us, but here you have the opportunity in free text to give us some insights to the sorts of things that we could do that may be of interest to you. So far, nothing. Oh, here we go. So some more round tables, great. We already are hosting some food system dialogues, but I think that could be extended. Valuation tools, standardized KPIs, interesting one and a very challenging one, um, but definitely needed. Well, we are working very, very diligently to get the PRI WBCSD partnership. So watch this space. Um, what ESG issues do investors find most important? Well, hopefully we'll get some insights into that today. But again, a very interesting uh, a question that we should do more work on. Information about the principles of sustainable financing, some networks with financial institutions, tools and guidelines, good practices, benchmarking results via versus ESG criteria, virtual convenings like this, so more webinars, information about new technologies and particularly blockchain, indeed, green bonds, sustainable bond guidelines, practices. So yes, uh, a lot of food for thought. And um, we will, uh, you know, I think you can still continue typing it in, but in the interest of time, 
and now hand over to my colleague Yi, who will take you through um, what we're doing um, uh, in terms of monitoring the impact of COVID-19 on our members. Thank you, Rodney. Uh, as Rodney just mentioned, I'm Yi Sun, uh, working as associate of the Redefining Value Program. I'm located out of New York. Uh, in the past few months, we have been tracking the share price, the member company's performance in the capital markets. So trying to understand what is emerging in the financial market during this crisis time, and how, we are, how are our company are coping with all the turbulence and all the, all the uncertainty in the space. Uh, we, we did have a few very interesting uh, findings want to share with all of you today. Uh, first thing is, you know, we're seeing some ESG outperformance across the membership. Take a snap snapshot of the 31 North American public traded company out of our membership. Uh, looking at the year to date ending at April 30th, uh, this portfolio in WBCC membership are beating the market by 9.5% comparing with S&P 500, which is probably the, the best benchmark we can have now today in the market. And, and more importantly, I think the 31 company also showing a V-shaped recovery and very rapidly almost return to the 2019 year end level uh, by the end of April this uh, last month, which is showing a quite stronger resiliency comparing with the market. Taking another look at the European, the 37 European public traded company in our membership, similar trend and during the recovery phase, this 37 company all outperformed by 4.3% uh, comparing with the stock your uh, 600 benchmark there. Uh, we, 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 we're also looking at all the Asian company we have in the house, uh, no matter whether they're located in greater China or Japan or India. I think those company are performing in line with the market and some are showing significantly higher performance uh, during the end phase uh, for recovery, uh, uh, suggesting they're more resilient in the market. Uh, you know, this finding definitely aligns with the mainstream view in the market, no matter whether Bloomberg, HSBC, or Morningstar are all indicating the ESG portfolio or uh, the sustainable investing uh, tools in the market are demonstrating a stronger performance, uh, especially during the COVID-19 turbulence. Uh, and based on also a previous study done by MSCI, we're seeing the more sustainable company are enjoying a lower cost of capital uh, from the equity market, from the debt market at the same time. But that being said, I think we're, we're pretty clear that, uh, you know, from year beginning to end of April, it is a very limited time period and correlation doesn't mean causation. But I think we are confident to say that sustainability at least is one indicator of a good company, a better management basis. Uh, I think that uh, suggests that our company are, uh, are kind of enjoying the benefit by seriously considering sustainable, sustainable you know, business practice from their operation, from the way they deal with the capital markets. And, and, and I think ESG, without being said, is a long-term thesis. So we're encouraging all the member company uh, to consider communicating ESG consider, uh, factor with the capital markets in a more consistent and uh, a longer term strategic thinking way and to, to have this interaction going forward. Uh, and another piece of information I think from our membership also worthwhile to share is the way they deal with uh, of, uh, you know, annual general meeting, what is the alternative way they can host this meeting and communicate with investors uh, as an annual event. So there's mainly three different options. Some companies are postponing the meeting, some companies are switching the meeting to either virtual or hybrid event, uh, the format of event. And based on the best practice for, from our member company, uh, 37 companies are converting the annual general meeting to virtual format. Uh, quite a few companies are selecting the hybrid meeting event, uh, hybrid meeting format, uh, most, mostly in the, in the European countries. And there's still a large portion of this company, 44% or so, are currently waiting and see 
to make their decision about annual driver meeting. So I think that's a good moment where we can capture some thought and, and insight from the audience today. And we're curious to learn about your plan to communicate sustainability with your investor in the capital markets. So with that, we're going to the next Monday question. Uh, and if you are just join the call, uh, please grab your cell phone or any mobile devices, go to www.monty.com and type in the access code 670999 to see the question and participate in the polling question. So the question for this part is, how have your plan to communicate sustainability with investor change in, in light of COVID-19? And we have five options here for you to choose from. You're keeping, first one, you're keeping similar level overall to interacting with engagement. Uh, second, you're reducing the direct communication with investor. Third, you're hosting more direct meeting to cover the social and economic aspect of COVID-19. The number four, uh, COVID-19 is everything you're doing here today. You, there's no time left for sustainability communication with investor. Uh, number five, you'll keep ramping up the sustainability, sustainability communication with investor because it's too important here. So we're seeing the trend based on the limited poll we have today, we have here right now. 50% uh, are voting for keep ramping up slightly a smaller percentage are keeping the similar level which are all promising to, 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 to see this ongoing effort for communication with investor. Some companies, some participants are reducing or uh, switching to more direct communication with investor. We'll leave the polling question open for your participation, but based on the result we received so far, uh, I think the majority of company participants in the call today are either ramping up or at least keeping the similar level of engagement with investor, demonstrating your confidence for uh, having an interaction, active inter uh, engagement with investor and, and, and to benefit your business. So that's definitely promising. So we welcome you, your, your polling question going forward, but for the interest of time, let's just go back to the main deck here. Cool, okay. So thank you, Ronnie, for your introduction about RV and I hope this result on capital markets and stock price performance of our member company uh, it's helpful for you to understand the current dynamic in the market. And with that being said, we're moving into the panel discussion, which is so exciting to hear about the expert from the market, about the finance and investment dynamic in the, in the time of COVID-19. Before handing over to Diane Strauss, who is the research director from Yale, and I'd like to share kind of a basic uh, illustrate your chart about the investment chain and we are featuring as many stakeholders as possible along the chain. So as a manager who control the capital, the mandate as an uh, sorry as an owner control capital mandate as a owner, as a manager to allocate capital and in between you have banks either commercial or investment bank play an intermediate role and the capital will move to a company and really focus on the real asset and in the operation or production. And ESG data and research firm are processing the ESG information that being produced by company and aggregate all the metrics indicator for the investor use. And credit, credit rating agency who will receive uh, here from Moody's today later are assigning credit rating result uh, on the debt market to uh, advise all the transaction. And we are featuring, uh, you can see from the chart here, asset manager, bank, company, and credit rating agency on this panel. So 
would be very helpful for, for the audience today to hear a diverse perspective from the market. So Diane, uh, handing over to you. Diane Strauss is Research Director of EO Initiative on Sustainable Finance. She has more than a decade experience and experience working on this field and advising NGO, uh, the ISM manager, and now academia to understand better on the dynamic on sustainable finance. So Diane, over to you. We're very de delighted to have you here. Thank you very much, Yi. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, all the participants. I think you are numerous to follow us today, so very, very glad. Um, today we're discussing how sustainable finance may evolve in the light of the COVID crisis. And uh, we're going to cover a number of uh, questions. Uh, we're trying to get the investor's perspective on the crisis. We're going to discuss the short-term consequences of the crisis on the investor-issuer's relationship. And we're going to exchange around the long-term trends that, uh, that may emerge from this crisis. So I'm very happy uh, and honored to discuss today with four distinguished speakers. We have Hervé Detail, Chief Sustainability Officer at BNP Paribas, Americas. Hervé, if you want to say hi, people can recognize you um, after that. I know there is Hello. Great. This is Hervé. John Hopner, Head of U.S. Stewardship and Sustainable Investment at Legal and General Investment Management. John, if you want to say hi to the audience, people can recognize you, even though there is your name. Hello, audience out there. Uh, Jose Luis Blasco, Global Sustainability Director at Axiona. Hi, Leanne. Hi, everybody. Hello. And uh, Matthew Kuchak, Assistant Vice President, ESG Risks at Moody's Investor Services. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today. Great. So we're very lucky to have all these people um, gathered to discuss that very, very uh, burning topic of the COVID crisis and how uh, the field of sustainable finance is adapting and adjusting to, to this crisis. Um, Let's start with one question, which we, which is, I would like to get your reactions to uh, the results of the survey you just presented, and general on the outperformance of ESG funds. Uh, could you provide some elements of answers and reasons from what you know around why the ESG funds would outperform the market? in the past eight to 12 weeks. Maybe, maybe we can have John start and then we'll follow up with other speakers. Sure. Um, well, hello again. Thanks everyone. Um, so I always would caution um, greatly of looking at short-term performance, I think as Yi had framed it. Um, but how I would react to that um, thesis is ESG, when it's really constructed best, is a, some reflection of long-term risk mitigation, long-term planning. And so potentially um, stripping out noise that you may be underexposed to energy, which has been particularly volatile or has under, underperformed, that thesis that long-term preparation. It could have a position to do with how much debt you're taking. It could have a position to do with um, quality of your board, or it could have the types of investors you're attracting. Um, it doesn't surprise me, but I think you, I would guess I would be very cautious to this audience um, that you don't necessarily want to sing from the treetops that ESG is outperforming and will continue to in, in, in most market cycles. Um, I will just say right up front um, for us, um, and it's uh, jumping a little bit to your next question, but I think it's really important for us that, you know, the first thing we did in the midst of this crisis was we reached out to all of the companies we, we have positions in. Uh, and we're a large index provider. We hold, you know, 
thousand public security. So we like the piece of every one of the, uh, the public companies that are on the phone, um, really emphasizing the fact that we're a long-term investor. And you know, our expectations is that you know you're you're really planning for the long term. You have to react. You have to get through this. But um, I guess it would be my 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 message back would be um, ESG as a reflection for long term is is really um, what where I would focus the the conversation rather than kind of short term volatility and um, would be would be my thoughts. I would like to to follow up on this and totally agree with uh, with John and. Initially, myself too, especially on these uh, stats, I was very um, cautious because for someone who's been working in sustainable finance for the last six years, um, I know that we should not convince people with uh, short-term uh, reasons. And, and having traded markets actually for 20 years, I, you, I, you also know that you can always find a chart that's going to prove your point. You know, you just change, choose your starting point and you'll find that tobacco outperformed this and that coal did, did, did that. So I was extremely um, uh, cautious and dismissive of those type of arguments in these days uh, because we know that all those funds have outperformed because um, they are underweight on uh, carbon intensive industries ranging from oil and gas to airlines, etc. This being said, this being said, it turns out that uh, carbon intensive industries um, uh, have to transform over, over the next uh, 20 years and 30 if uh, we have no other choice. And we know that. And, and so you can, however, make that claim that both those funds um, made a long-term choice for um, industries that are not accelerating the pace of transition and this crisis, even though it's not related to climate change, but uh, this type of crisis sh show the vulnerabil vulnerability of, uh, of certain industries in our over-consuming world. Uh, and, and we can see that even external shocks that are not directly re re related to climate change, and pandemics could be very well related to cl climate change in the future, but uh, how uh, we live in a world that's so vulnerable to fast decarbonization pathways. Uh, and, um, and so then you could claim that those type of indices um, are also built up upon, um, uh, are definitely built upon choices from the investment managers, which are long-term oriented. And, um, but I totally agree with John that uh, it's the resilience over the long-term that than the coincidental uh, composition of the basket that matters. Matt, yeah, Luis, Jose, you want to react to this? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm fully, I feel like I think it's a consequence of the how these indexes are made because our focus on risk, and when you are focusing on risk, you have the consequence of less volatility. Uh, but I wonder how the uh, financial sector is understanding the opportunity, because the, the, you need to take into account that all of these indexes that now are performing very well are made with information from the companies in 2018. Hey, this is amazing, it's, it's because you, you, it's, uh, um, um, but it's, I think that we need to improve how we can capture the opportunity that Hervé has mentioned, the, this transition and how the current systems are currently uh, um, capturing this information. And I think, for example, the, the taxonomy of the European Union or, or a, a another, most of them ethical decision about this investment on oil and gas are in, the, in this direction. But I am not sure how the, the financial sector has the, uh, the equipment uh, enough, sophisticated in order to identify what is in the right pathway or to go forward or not. I think that's a very good uh, way to ask Matthew. Matthew is, is working on risk uh, in a credit trading agency. Matthew, do you think there is a way to get more information from the issues on short-term risk, long-term risks and opportunities, especially in, the, in this crisis? That's a good question. Uh, I mean, I think we're we're at the early stages of having very systematic 
consistent reporting from companies on ESG risk. I think governance has obviously been something that's a bit more ingrained in credit analysis and has been a bit, you know, part of the process for a while. We, we looked at on the climate side, as an example, um, bank uh, climate reporting. And while, while there's about 85% of the banks that we look at um, have committed to TCFD reporting, uh, the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures, um, we say only about a third have robust financial um, disclosures attached to, to the climate side of things for now. So we're, we're at the early stages of having um, information that I say is consistent, transparent, and, and we can really use to understand risk exposures. Um, you know, I think this is a good example of, of uh, an event risk, but ESG risks tend to be long dated as the, as the others have said. So a lot of what we're, um, you know, a lot of what we're looking at is thinking about how do we, how do we view these risks over a long period of time? So on, on the climate side, we're looking at um, carbon transition assessments that, that look at, for those companies that are really exposed uh, to carbon transition risk, what is their near-term exposure based on their current business profile? What does their response efforts look like to that based on their investments in alternative technologies or, or changing their product mix? And then ultimately, what is, this, what is the long-term credit impact um, as a result of this and what based on their resilience? So everything we're looking at from, from a disclosure perspective, we're trying to put back in the context of um, you know, what is the resilience to this? And I think, you know, as we talk about kind of the short-term outperformance versus the long-term resilience, you know, I think it's analogous to how we're thinking about our, our credit analysis at this point. So we've, we've downgraded around almost 20% of our non-financial corporates um, throughout the crisis. And if you look at the distribution in terms of the ratings, credit ratings of those entities, it's almost all the speculative grade as opposed to investment grade entities. And that's because they're more highly levered, less liquidity, uh, you know, more, more tenuous uh, business models, uh, whereas the investment grade companies have the liquidity and, and preparation to be resilient throughout this kind of crisis. Um, and when we, when we think about our credit ratings, we're going to see a weaker performance um, from financial results over the near term. But as we look through, through the cycle, um, you know, these companies really have the, the ability, the governance, the, the financial performance to help maintain their credit quality through the cycle. I think in some ways ESG is also through the cycle. What, what, what does this look like over a period of time? So you know, as we talk about disclosure, we're, we're trying to understand what is the long-term exposure and how we think about resilience. Um, but we're, we're at the early stages of, of, I think, a lot of these things. Great. So, so disclosure is one way to communicate from, uh, between the investor and the issuer. It's one way that we understand it is, is biased towards the past because it's, it's information that is 18 months old, that it can be forward looking, but it's difficult. What are the other ways to communicate with, uh, that you have found to communicate with, uh, with your issuers, especially in the light of the crisis? That's my question. And I just want to make a point before you answer is that you can ask questions in the chat box um, if you're interested to ask a question and Yi will actually uh, cluster these questions and ask them in the course of our discussion. So um, yes, really what uh, uh, Jose, uh, no sorry, John, you were uh, speaking around uh, about uh, how you've initiated the, the discussion with your issuer. Uh, how do you generally engage or discuss and start the conversation around risk and opportunities with your issuer? And what kind of information do you expect from them? Um, hopefully you can hear me. My internet was going in and out. Um, so it's too early is the, is the straight answer in terms of how, what is the exact flow of information. Um, I could tell you that um, one of our requests has been around beyond, maybe many of you have seen that Bill Hinman and Jake Layton uh, recently wrote a paper or a letter on um, disclosing financial stability and some human capital metrics around, you know, keeping your workers healthy. That is like immediate need and that's the first wave of information that we're requesting um but i think what's what's to come is still is still too early okay some other panelists have yeah if i can add to this um <clears throat> there is the angle of disclosure and let the investor uh, look through this decide what they want but there is concurrently um 
there is also the production of new products that uh, spotlight, highlight, showcase precisely this opportunity side uh, to investors by crafting and delivering securities that are, uh, again, uh, showcasing uh, sustainable initiatives or um, uh, giving explicit targets to corporations uh, in, with regard to sustainability. So that's re really what sustainable finance has done over the last uh, six years, primarily. Uh, in two different ways. The first wave of product was so-called the use of proceeds product. So it's the famous green bonds and all their cousins, you know, uh, social bond, gender bond, vaccine bonds, blue bonds, I mean, uh, uh, rhino bonds even. So where you basically put a tag, a label on, um, on, the, on, on the use of proceeds. And so for even, um, you know, carbon intensive companies, it's an opportunity uh, to showcase uh, their development of course, we exercise judgment to make sure that it's at a pace uh, that's in line uh, with the Paris Accord to reach the targets. And the other types of instruments are more uh, are general use of proceeds, but instead there is a string attached to the interest rate where the interest rate will move up or down in relation to the achievement of some sustainable performance targets. Uh, so you have a penalty uh, if you don't perform well and you have an incentive to outstretch uh, and outperform uh, your, your sustainability targets. So this can be a way to, over to emphasize, I would say, this, the opportunity side uh, when uh, you have so much disclosure and it's hard sometimes to, 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 to um, get, get it out. So a way to signal for companies that they are intending to be uh, sustainable and to attract sustainable investors being uh, uh, trying to issue a green bonds or to, as you said, um, uh, conditionalize their uh, in interest rate to uh, ESG performance. Uh, interesting. Um, so, Jose, what do you think around the, 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 the best way to communicate with, uh, with issuers, especially in the light of the crisis in this, in this short term um, uh, moment where, where investors need information around what's happening uh, in the company, with their employees, in the governance? What, yeah. what are the best way to communicate? Yes, I think there are two contents, uh, from my opinion. Uh, the first part of the, of the crisis, you need to be very involved in how to communicate about the health and the, how you can carry in your company and also the liquidity challenges that you are facing that they are very, very um, important. But now, I think that the most important thing is about how you are facing the recovery, this, this new recovery. Why? Because Sometimes we, we are talking about resilience. I, I, to, to be honest, I, I don't like the, the word resilience because resilience comes from the Latin resilio, which is jump back. I don't want to jump back, to be honest. I want to jump forward. Why? Because the, 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 the world that we are trying to, to dis describe or to, to transform should be more sustainable. And we have five trillions of uh, public stimulus in the coming months coming to the national economies. I am wondering how the companies are well prepared, well equipped to get this amount of effort in order to serve the short-term needs about jobs and, uh, and health, and also prepare to the next generation on infrastructure and development. Because if not, in, in, in five or 10 years, we will have double debt. One is the debt that we are giving to our sons today, and the second debt will be to transform the economy that we have developed in the coming weeks, in the coming months. And, and I am wondering uh, um, if we need to be more uh, vocal when we are talking about how, what kind of recovery we want and how the financial sector has a role to play uh, in order to make it happen. Okay. Um, any uh, the other panelists, do you want to react on w what is it exactly that you're going to scrutinize in the E, in the S, in the G, uh, over the short term and over the long term in uh, in companies? W we covered the G already. Do you, are, are you are you going to expect more information on 
liquidity, uh, the way to, to, to manage and to get out of this uh, crisis and what kind of information for, for our audience here, which is composed mainly of, of businesses, what is it exactly that you're gonna expect um, that is not yet already in the report? I mean, I'd, I'd say from, you know, from our perspective, a lot of the attention, I mean, we've taken a lot of rating actions already and some, there's, there's a lot of negative outlooks on, on our ratings. There's a, still a, a fair number of ratings under review. You know, those, those analyses are going to vary by, by the rating level for some companies. And it's a lot of the, the sub-investment grade entities that are dealing with, you know, acute liquidity stress, uh, potentially could be receiving some government aid. Um, you know, scenario analysis and planning of what's likely to occur. Those conversations are the, the near-term conversations we're going to be having to understand, um, you know, what the trajectories look like. I'd say that doesn't, you know, divert attention away from some of the long-term challenges we're seeing um, for, for companies. That, that includes environmental and social challenges. So for those entities that are, that are dealing with carbon transition, we're having the conversations about business model ongoing, understanding what does that future state look like. Um, around social risks, you know, the, the, we're, we're also also having those conversations depending on what en entities are, 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 are subject, um, you know, to a variety of, of these challenges. So those are a lot of times longer term in nature. You know, I think what, what we've said is that ESG, where relevant, has been, um, you know, in our credit ratings. We just haven't necessarily called it ESG in a specific section. Um, that's changed where we've become a bit more transparent around that. So if you look at our Moody's credit opinions now, you'll see ESG sections where we're trying to break those risks out. Um, and then there are emerging risks such as climate, physical climate change and, and carbon transition that are longer dated. Um, so it's a mix of understanding the short-term pressures and then keeping that in the context of what are the, some of the long-term credit drivers that we're seeing. If I may add from the, um, so uh, bank angle, um, the, this has done two things for us. Um, so first of all, absolutely the long term for us environmental uh, is probably unfortunately the biggest uh, uh, source of all the problems we have including uh, social inequalities but um, the so the two things are the first one is when we bring a, a product to market uh, regardless of what it is a uh, green bond for a wind farm or whatever we um, make sure that uh, the overall um, sustainability profile of the issuer is in line you know, with the specific project they're bringing to market. And so what this crisis has done is uh, reshift the focus indeed on some social aspects, social man management of some social issues within companies, especially uh, uh, employee welfare and benefits, as well as the uh, potential vulner vulnerability of supply chain. I think that's the, uh, the, the two elements that have been brought back a little, bit to, a little bit to the fore in the analytical picture. And on the opportunity picture, um, this has been rebalancing a little bit temporarily, but uh, bringing again to the fore that uh, there are social initiatives that are uh, that warrant sustainable finance to be supporting, uh, range, ranging from support to uh, health uh, manufacturing to uh, uh, alleviating some social so, so economic burden of SMEs or uh, people affected by uh, temporary and furlough for unemployment. So there's been a re rebalancing, but certainly not at the expense of the old long-term issues we've been focused for, uh, for, for years now. Okay, so the E, the S and the G are the three elements are really uh, needed in, in this uh, information. Uh, and that's interesting to see that they are not the same time horizon. The S is more pressing on the short term and the E is more pressing on the long term. And the G needs to be transformed, if I understand well, because from what I know, at least uh, the, the information on the G was not necessarily fitted to purpose, but we can cover that in, uh, in the next question. Uh, John, did you want to, did you want to uh, add yeah, anything? I was gonna jump in briefly. Yeah, I think how we think about it. So I sit in the stewardship team. So I'm really looking at principles rather than company specific issues much of the time and many of our governance principles for example the 
diversity of a board, the independence of chairman and CEO, overboarding. These issues are kind of long-term core governance questions. Our view would be in a time of a crisis, each of those issues is even more pronounced in how important it is. Um, I'm regularly engaging with companies, asking them how many meetings they're holding in times of crisis. And many companies say they have it at meetings every two weeks. Well, if you're overboarded, then, then how are you going to be prepared and, and, and responsible? So those are long-term principle issues that are now coming to the fore and becoming even more important. Um, and then there are always, always a host of very kind of tactical, you know, as you mentioned, um, tactical um, social issues. You know, for example, one issue that I think is going to be a very interesting issue to emerge is how companies handle whistleblowing related to um, COVID sensitivities, right? We're all bringing our workers back to our office. And uh, what are the policies to make sure people feel comfortable um, putting up a signal if there's something that, they're, that they feel uncomfortable with? Um, very few companies have thought through that. And as a whole industry, we don't know how to do that. So in some of our engagement calls, we're really pressing companies to explain, you know, how are they preparing to do that? Not that anyone has the right answer, but it's just an example, right? We, we all have a, a whistleblowing policy but have we really tested it in a time like of, of such a, a, an emergency? That's very interesting. And hence also a liability risk may be coming with the whistleblowing if, if we consider that um, employers have not, um, have not made their uh, best effort to uh, secure, the, secure the, the, the safety of their employees, I imagine. Um, I, I've got to, uh, a question and then we'll move to the questions that are in the chat box with you. Uh, I, I'm really wondering, and this is a candid question, do, do you feel as a responsible investors that there will be a tension between the need for liquidity in the companies and their efforts to um, ensure the safety of their employees, uh, bring them back to work, uh, ensure that they are that their employees are being protected and can be can can be um, can continue their living if they cannot go to work. Is there a tension between short-term financial needs from the company and the way they treat their employees? And how is a responsible investor uh, able to deal with this uh, dealing with this question? Maybe Jose, do you want to to start? To, to be honest, to be honest, I I I, I am I don't I don't see that dilemma because uh, if you don't keep both topics at the same time, probably you don't survive. Why? Because uh, you you have the liquidity is in the short term, but the liabilities that you don't care to to your to to your people also is huge. And I I am not sure that I can understand this dilemma for an investor side. Um, um, but this is very relevant in terms of how the responsible investment or the ESG investors are looking at the issuers. That this is very relevant in terms that they are looking for risk all this all the time. They are so talking about asking about risk. Well, where, how you are, how your uh, supply chain are. What are you prepared for? Blah blah blah. blah. Sorry, who is buying your products? Who is buying your investments? Because if you are giving only this, the profile of the risk, the ESG will become probably mainstream. But I invite you to, to take the, I, I call it Greta Thunberg acid test. Who will buy your products if you only talk about traditional a uh, way of approach about ESG, about risk. I wonder if we need to transform these kind of things in two ways. One is the Rodney's remark. I don't have a distinguished distinction in between financial and non-financial because at the end of the day, the non-financial are financial. That's fine, this is mainstream. They are, this is the way that we are managing this liquidity or, 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 or healthy people. This is not the dilemma, it's in the same package of risk and, um, and performance. But I wonder if we are prepared to ask the question from the 
final clients of this investment. Why you are investing in this ESG fund to the oil and gas company? Why you are investing in airlines? Why you are investing in this kind of companies who are transitioning to, uh, I think that this is uh, uh, um, a new, uh, probably a new um, um, stage of, of development. One is the mainstream ESG risk analysis uh, by design, and the other is the, the new products of sustainable investment in the future, may, maybe more focus on impact in outcome. Okay, thank you. And the, the other speakers, do, do you find also that there is no conflict, no tension between the short-term need for uh, li uh, liquidity and, uh, and the social, the, the, um, trying to, uh, to be as social as possible for companies? This would be very good news. I, I, I will. I'll uh, take the other. <laughs> what, do you want to go first? <laughs> no, no Hervé, Hervé, you go. You go. No, so I can't. I, I, I'll, uh, can't comment exactly on the, re the the link between liquidity and return to work. Uh, if that's the uh, the risk you take with returning to work, if that's what you're asking, the liquidity need I absolutely see. But um, from my vantage point, I have a similar concern, which is the need for liquidity and not deviating from all the good intentions that uh, we had two months ago. So I'm not talking about safety of employees, but I'm talking about uh, which I hope was there, but but more. And, you know, on, uh, on the path to uh, align with a below two degree scenario uh, over the next two decades. So uh, for me, the key to that, um, because the, the, liquid, the need for liquidity is there, I mean, and, 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 and I sympathize with all, all, all those people in this crunch, but putting, uh, putting um, uh, ties into the financial product where you give, the, you extend the liquidity but the rate and uh, maybe the, the, extent, the tenor extension, is, things like that, is tied to the achievement of sustainability performance targets in the future, uh, for me, is, uh, is important. I would, uh, with Jose Luis, I would hope that safety of employees comes first anyway, so that you should not even have to do that. Uh, and by the way, at a gov governmental level, to some extent, that's what has been done, I believe, with uh, the support to Air France, uh, where I believe the, uh, the extension that the government uh, gave to Air France was tied to uh, the achievement of uh, some CO2 emission reduction targets, I believe, in the future. So same idea. John, any reaction before we jump to the questions that are on the chat box? Sure. I think, you know, I, I interpreted the question a little differently, which is, is there a tension between human capital management, uh, um, the management of your workforce and, you know, sh business needs and, and you know, uh, survivability? And yeah, yes, was, absolutely. There's a, a tremendous, tremendous tension. Um, and, you know, I, I keep, I fall back to the way that I think in terms of the investment stewardship team at legal in general and trying to impress principles onto a future solution, right? So companies have, they, they have to pay attention to their stakeholders and they have to survive. And that is, there's a tension there. The, the problem that I see from an investor perspective is we really don't have the data we, we need to, to evaluate human capital management strategies really well, right? So just basic things like the workforce composition of how much contractor works, full-time works across your whole business, the total expense across your whole business, the turnover across your whole business, the diversity, ethnic, gender across your whole business. And, you know, for us, we've, we were part of a group called Human Capital Management Coalition that's pushing these types of disclosures um, on companies to really, that's a starting point so that you can start to see how companies are making these trade-off decisions. You don't get that much transparency, right? So we hear of you know, massive layoffs and we don't know whether that's all part-time, is that full-time, exactly how that's playing out. And so that, that trade-off, um, we don't have enough visibility. So I guess our, our firm position is that 
we're going to have to enhance disclosure around human capital management. I think you see a lot of rhetoric in the market. You know, many of you are probably familiar with Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. They're going to be improving their human capital metrics. So I think that's going to be where this goes is you need better data so that you can watch how companies evaluate that trade off. Do you want to uh, ask some questions from the uh, chat box? Yes. And first, thank you for the audience uh, putting your question in the chat box. And we encourage, encourage all the participants to keep doing that while we're going uh, with the discussion here. Uh, there are quite a few interesting questions and uh, three questions around the role of finance sector or investor community. What's, you know, given the, the, the panelists, uh, the, the lineup here today, uh, you know, what, what role can finance sector to play to push for more sustainability in the market? Can we create a novel economic system? Uh, you know, how are you doing to kind of highlight the importance of ESG factor to the market and enable a world to build back better? And a question about what new tools are you using to deal with greenwashing? For example, are you using the EU Sustainable Finance Taxonomy or the European Green, Green New Deal, for example, to determine the investment you're making are really green? So a, a kind of overarching question about the, the role of investor community are playing here. And, and I will address other questions later. Who wants to jump in? Matthew? Yeah, I can start on the, you know, the role of the financial sector. I think um, you know, it's important to note from, from the credit rating agency perspective, you know, our mandate is to provide an opinion on credit worthiness through the lens of probability of default and loss in the event of default. So, you know, we, we don't, um, you know, we can't advocate or push for any sort of specific uh, sustainability policies. I think what we do look for is transparency and, and consistent disclosure mechanisms. So we are involved in, in a variety of, of those activities. SASB has been mentioned, uh, the TCFD uh, work has been mentioned, we've been involved in both of those initiatives as an example. So ultimately for us understanding that, that consistent transparency uh, around disclosure is helpful for us to, to get a comparative look uh, around um, you know, the exposure to these risks. Um, beyond sort of the credit rating agency within Moody's, we're, we're, we've invested in a couple of companies, um, Vigio Iris in, in Paris and 427 in Berkeley um, to, to help provide tools to the market beyond the credit side of things. Um, so Vigio Iris focuses on ESG scores at the issuer level as in addition, as well as green social and sustainability bond and sustainability link services. I think ultimately there, there's, we're seeing a demand for tools that provide, um, you know, opinions on sustainability uh, and beyond uh, the credit side. So not, not everything in, in ESG scores has a credit material aspect to it. Uh, with 427, we're looking at physical climate risk tools. Um, we're using those as inputs into our ratings and research to understand, um, you know, more consistently how are entities exposed to physical climate risk and then ultimately, what's their ability to, to deal with those potential physical exposures? Uh, but we're seeing a lot of demand for those kinds of products that, that aren't just credit focused, but look at some of that exposure. So you know, we, again, we can't really push for sustainability disclosures or policies, um, but, but ultimately we're looking to provide tools and transparency to the market to make those decisions in a consistent way. On the, on the greenwashing question, um, you know, I think, you know, we're, we're seeing a variety of different standards um, and taxonomies develop around the globe. So I think the, the EU work tends, seems to be top of mind right now. And, and, and how will that play out both in Europe and also will there be global applicability? Um, there's obviously the, the International Capital Market Association's work on the green bond standard. Uh, green bond principles, social bond principles has been sort of the the most broadly applicable, probably not as in-depth as things like the Climate Bonds Initiative Taxonomy or the EU work, um, but we're starting to see those get uh, a little bit more traction, but still at early at early stages, and especially in terms of global comparability and applicability. 
on the first question, uh, to me, the answer is sustainable finance. Um, we live in a world that has at least two flaws uh, with our topic. The first one is we're not pricing negative externalities. We're, we're giving subsidies uh, and we're not pricing uh, uh, the cost of, uh, of carbon, basically. The second is uh, at the policy level, um, overall uh, policies to look warm. Um, we'll see if we have a Green New Deal. I think we'll see bits and pieces of it, but I don't think, I think uh, the, uh, the same tension you were mentioning between the need for liquidity and, and, and the social we'll see in the policy sector between the need of a quick, uh, uh, easy, uh, non-controversial uh, boost to the economy and what we really need for the long term. So, so basically we have those two flaws, not pricing externalities and having uh, policies which are too slow. Uh, to do what we need for the long term. So the solution comes from the private sector. Hopefully uh, we can enroll the policy uh, faster around us. And that solution to me is sustainable finance. Finance is about pricing the present into the, pricing the future into the present. And for me, sustainable finance is about pricing unsustainability into the present. And, um, and so pricing unsustain, unsustainability is the solution. And by that, I, I, I have a very general, a wide exception, a wide meaning of the world. Where uh, sure, uh, us banks crafting products, we are going to try to price that unsustainability in the products. But it's also coming from rating agencies, uh, which indirectly through uh, their uh, ratings and score influence uh, that price, uh, as well as investors uh, from you know even a vanilla security they offered, uh, give, uh, depending on the governance um, stance of a firm or not, they will want to buy or not to buy. And that all of that together, all that ecosystem influenced the price. And so we need more sustainable investors. We need more uh, sustainable finance providers. We need uh, rating agencies to further inco inco incorporate those issues. And that's how we restore this invisible hand uh, that has been lacking in that space. Um, and just to finish on, the, on that topic, just to give you an example, what we've done on the sustainable finance side from the uh, product manufacturers side we've not invented anything uh, we're, we're not doing anything we're just second second hand in this whole thing but what we've created is a race to the top uh, there's nothing that a green bond was, uh, would have not financed so uh, we've not really uh, that's not where the genius of the green bond is but it's in this the labeling for example has created a race to the, to the top and a divide between green brown and transition between uh, light green and dark green between green and greener between greener and greenest and we recreate an emulation and a competi competition between private uh, borrowers to uh, outbest uh, themselves, to outperform each other uh, for, for, for the better and the common good. So that would be my answer to how we restore or accelerate or make finance better. Um, and on the question of the greenwashing, I'm really not uh, concerned about that. Sure, uh, there have been issues here and there at the border, uh, some green bonds that were kind of dubious or whatever, but, but here the, the tree should not hide the forest. Uh, in the last six years, we've achieved a tremendous revolution. We still have 44 years to go, simply because I was saying 50 years, six years ago. Uh, but I think we're at the very beginning of it, and yet so much what was inexistent in the dialogue has is now part of all the dialogue in finance whether we like it or not it's not implemented yet but it's in everyone's dialogue so greenwashing i'm not really much concerned the market seems to be very self-regulated um, and uh, and outliers are quickly spotted and uh, criticized uh, in the press of our investors so i'm not saying it's perfect but i think that's um uh, and surely we should be on our tiptoes and safeguard that uh, uh, and, 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 and also much more could be done because as I said, uh, I, I yet to see what, uh, uh, sustain, what uh, sustainable has financed that conventional finance could not have done. Uh, but I don't think that's where the issue is. Jose, do you want to, to comment on the questions? 
Yes, I am only pointed out that um, for a company, it's very difficult to comply with all the requirements of information that we receive every year. Uh, for example, we fulfill seven, seven different ESG information providers for different investors. Uh, my question in, in this case is in two ways. One is about um, this, this information, um, the, 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 how, we'll be, we'll how we can evolve the current reporting system in order to serve better to the information requirement for the investors and at the same time don't concentrate a lot the the rating providers that we have at this moment at this moment i think this is a very interesting dilemma because uh in some way the investors are requesting more and more information but nobody knows what happened with this information but because they cannot mm, manage in the right way because they have not the critical mass enough in order to compare i think that in the information uh, world and how to report from the companies and how the investors should apply this information into their models. I think it's, 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 a, it's a lot of improvements to, 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 to do. I don't know if our colleagues in the, um, have another opinion, but at least uh, as, as an issuer, uh, we have a lot of challenges about how we can provide the right information in the right time about the, the the, the 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 topics but most of the investors are talking about the same things uh, but with different metrics with different approaches in different times yes and, and that's basically an endeavor uh, pursued by the wbcsd in bridging uh, uh the different frameworks we know this is uh, there is a fatigue here uh uh, from from issuers uh, and they don't know which which framework to report on and uh, these frameworks are similar in purpose sometimes but different in form which um, which is uh, taking a lot of resources from from issuers that's what we hear uh, John do you want and, to Diane and Diane seems yeah. that it is not enough <laughs> <laughs> it's never enough <laughs> um, yeah and we're asking more now on governance and uh, social data in the light of the crisis so it's also that we've not um, we've not come up to the perfect system yet uh, definitely John do you want to give us your your thoughts on what uh, where is the financial system going and how to improve sustainable finance <laughs> Sure. Um, I, let me first comment on the last point around data, because uh, it's something we spend a, a lot of time on, and I'm, I'm involved on the um, investment advisory group of SASB, uh, and actually a few other different data groups. You know, big picture, um, it is improving, right? So I think there, it, it's gotten a lot noisier. There's a lot more frameworks, but I think we're now entering a phase towards consolidation. Um, that said, there will always be many new data groups that want companies to report new data. And I think the market will, over time, sort out what has been valuable. Um, but I would, I would signal to particularly all the corporates on the phone that, um, you know, it's really important to understand what's the purpose. And like for us, long-term investors, we have lots of different index strategies that use inputs from you. We try to be as transparent as possible how we use your data. And certain data you're gonna say, well, it might not be you know, material for some types of analysis, but it will be material for others. Um, so I think that you just have to really understand who's using your data and, and you, know, you can make a conscious decision to, to, to not include that data or to include it. But you know, I think it's, um, you just have to get to the, get to the bottom of, of what the purpose is. Um, in terms of, um, I, I, I also interpreted the original question a little bit around like regulatory concepts. Um, so I, I, I think I agree with the previous co um, comments that I, I'm, I'm much more confident that the global capital markets are pushing towards um, solutions faster than any independent regulatory body. So I'm, I'm not particularly 
you know, I'm, I'm not confident that the U.S. regulatory group is going to be pushing this fast enough. So I, I see the global capital markets as playing, playing a much bigger role there. Um, I'm not sure if I have much more to add that's going to be so exciting. But I would also echo, I think it was Hervé's point, that I'm not so worried about um, misusing of greenwashing. I think there's some, some minor, minor problems with it. But I think um, it's, it's much more to do with an understanding of what the data is. Right? Um, and I was looking at a chat function question around like, you know, could Exxon ever be considered a, a green business or not or ESG? ESG. You know, the, the problem is that it's so, there's a lot of um, difference between the underlying metrics you're using, right? So if you use, you know, dollars spent towards R&D on clean energy, you might have these perverse situations where large oil majors are considered really green because they're spending the most on R&D, even though clearly that's not core to their strategy. So um, I, I guess I, it is a little bit of a concept of the devils in the details. And so I think the greenwashing thing will, will generally um, sort itself out in the market. But there are technicalities where you have to be really careful how you sell these products. Um, and I think there's, there's going to be, that'll get sorted out over time. And if I may add, uh, for me, for me uh, what would be very important as far as the environmental piece goes, I'm not talking about the social, would be to have a temperature rating. For me, the key question when I look at a company um, in relation to some environmental sustainable finance product, like a green bond or whatever, is where do they sit, where do they sit on a temperature pathway? Are, is their business bringing us to 2 degrees, 4.3, 5.7 degrees? Um, it's hard to, to, uh, to, to, to figure out. Some NGOs and others have come up with different ways of doing it. Uh, so there may be a range, there may be, I don't know. But to me, that would be the key question, quite frankly. And having a, maybe a rating, you know, a, a very granular rating where um, investors can decide. And you could, do a, you could also apply the same to portfolios, by the way. And some have done, you know, Swiss Re has, uh, and GPIF have said, our portfolio is warming up the planet by X. Um, but to me, that would be an advancement, aside from, uh, not, in, not in replacement, but uh, in addition to existing uh, ESG uh, lenses that we have. Yeah, so here moving away, or um, not moving away, but in addition to, to risks, having uh, a perspective of, of the business and the activities and the pathway of, of this business and activities. Um, Yi, do you have any other questions for the panel? Yes, sure. Uh, there's an earlier question about startup companies. Any recommendation for startup to deal with this uncertain time? And you know, how can they for potentially secure uh, investment and which are interested in the startup business? So maybe just quickly go across the panel for your opinion and input. So I think the reason why, uh, so I leave you the opportunity panel to, to answer, but um, uh, the four panelists are, or the three that are in, uh, uh, here in, in businesses that deal more with listed equities and, and fixed income. So they're generally not, I, I guess, uh, specialists with startups, but they, uh, they are uh, green investment funds. Um, uh, that that are uh, specialized in in green pro, uh, startups. Maybe the the panel can offer some resources if uh, if they know about it. I don't, but the, uh, the and I will defer to Jose Luis actually. But my observation in in the environmental space is um, the um, the actually oil and gas companies and and utilities have. Uh, great practices in the form of uh, uh, incubators or uh, VC funds or whatever, which can be a great help, I think, in partnering with uh, bridging the large companies with this ecosystem of emerging uh, startups and ideas and where great partnerships uh, can be potentially made. How much time do we have left? Um, 
I think we are almost at the time, but maybe have one or two minutes for the panel. So can you can I ask uh, the panelists to maybe conclude on uh, what they see is the um, what are going to be the key challenges and the key opportunities of being a sustainable investors in the in the next year and years? In a very few words. Matthew, you want to start? Yeah, I can kick off. I mean, I think I think the interesting thing is obviously how um, permanent some of these changes are that we're we're starting to see as a result of the crisis. So, you know, in some ways, I think what we had seen pre-pandemic start to emerge is going to be accelerated in some ways. So, I think on, on the finance side, I think the the shift to thinking about sustainability, both through the lens of how are green investments, uh, what are the social implications of green investments, and and ultimately what are the green implications of social investments. I think that's something we started to see emerge, thinking about these things more holistically and not just, are you building a, a wind farm somewhere and it's green? But how does that, you know, what are the social implications of that? And then ultimately, how does it play into the broader sustainability strategy? I think that's, that's an interesting um, thing that we're going to see, I think, accelerate um, in addition to a number of other societal changes that are likely coming as a result of this. John? Sure. I know this group is, is well versed on all things climate. So I'm going to skip that one and say that the big trend to keep a close eye on is, is on the social human capital side, workers, workers' rights. Um, I think that's going to be a, a really big area in the broad ESG discussion in a post-COVID world. Um, of course, environment, but I, I'm just kind of saying this is something really new I think is going to emerge. So I don't know what, um, but I think um, you might see the role of unions play up in the U.S. or who knows. But I think that's just going to be an area where I think everyone needs to sharpen uh, their metrics and their messaging. Yeah, I can confirm that there is a, a union starting up in France that is um, meant to be an eco-union, ecological union. Um, so I think this is definitely a, a topic that is upcoming in the, in the next years. Uh, Jose, do you want to, to conclude? Yes, uh, um, I want to be provocative in my last uh, intervention. I think that the ESG, as we see now, will disappear uh, because have no sense, because will be in the mainstream, will be part of the common sense of to how to assess companies uh, and part of the risk assessment. The new ESG or the new sustainability investment should look for real impact. The current model don't channel any any penny to the green economy. We need to change the way that we are making things, me, be more uh, aggressive and uh, in terms of how we are measuring the real impact that we are uh, doing in the transition and the society. And I think that we are in the right in the right uh, uh, direction. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, as a conclusion, I will have two predictions and one question. Um, the first prediction is that the public sector is going to miss uh, the opportunity, uh, at least uh, at the speed we need them to embrace it. Uh, so we'll have a, a lot of nice green deals on the table, but I'm afraid we're going to adopt them way too late in years. The second prediction is I'm 100% confident that the private sector and finance especially is going to make this all pervasive you know, within the next couple of years. Um, so I'm a bit less concerned by my first point. So these are my two predictions and my question and it's actually a worry. Um, there is one risk we absolutely need to fully re-embrace and it's the risk of um, in-person social interactions. And I'm extremely pessimistic of how we're going to get out of this uh, crisis. Um, we're going to fear the second wave, then we're going to fear the next seasonal virus that comes on, etc. Plus, we're going to be um, used to a different way of working, etc. When actually, I think the next in-person business meetings will look odd. The same way Zoom might look odd, I think will be uncomfortable. And so I'm making a joke out of it, but I think it will unfortunately 
shape the way we think and we uh, and we and we think about uh, sustainability issues in a in a very pernicious way because it's going to be extremely silent and at the margin, but it may it may be a, a threat. Thank you, Hervé. That's indeed a worry. So thank, thank you. you, thank you to all the panelists, and I, um, I let Rodney conclude on the session. Indeed, thank you very much, Diane, and to Herve, John, Jose, Louise, and Matt uh, for taking the time to share your insights and thoughts on what is unprecedented um, situation that we're facing. But we are facing it, and life, as they say, must go on. And so, um, based on, on, on what we've heard today, I think there are some key, key things for us all to go away and to think through. But as we are um, thinking through the, the best way of resolving the current crisis, we, we want to make sure that at the WBCSD, we keep our focus on sustainable development. We can't come out of this and have you know, not learnt from, from the lessons and also must remember that the, the, the climate crisis, the climate emergency, the biodiversity loss and the inequality continues to be there. And in fact, this virus um, has in many ways shown that it does actually discriminate and it is the most vulnerable in society. It is the lowest ped um, that is actually getting us through it. And so hopefully we've learned, we will learn through this. And to that effect, WBCSD is is offering um, a, a way of disseminating good practices from across our member companies. And so I would encourage you all to visit the wbcsd.org forward slash COVID-19 website where you will find lots of insights. And in the next page, I'm also able to um, share with you some of the other things that have already been covered on today's webinar, but we'll go into more detail in the coming weeks. And that is on Wednesday this week, my colleagues in Redefining Value will be taking us through the learnings from the TCFD and the next steps that we can expect in implementation of the four recommendations. And this is uh, coupled with an exciting event that we're hosting in partnership with PRI on the 14th of May. And I've just put the link to this event um, in the chat function now. Um, so this is organized by PRI and I would encourage anybody that's interested in ESG and credit risk analysis to join that. Next week, we will see um, uh, another webinar looking this time at pension plans and 401k plans. And also on the 20th of May, and as a, again, a theme that's come through from today's webinar, we'll have a, a focus on modernizing governance and engaging with directors um, in the challenging times ahead. What is the role of the board during a crisis? Is it to have oversight or should they be more hands-on? These are all the things that we'll discuss in the coming weeks. In addition, uh, later today, the WBCSD will be inviting you all to join in on webinars that we'll be hosting with Baker McKenzie that will look at regional perspectives and uh, address questions and concerns around the, the, the legal system and how that needs to support the return to work, privacy, etc. So without further ado, I know we're a little bit over time, I just want to say thank you to everybody. Uh, thank you all for taking the time to join us today. Take a look in your inbox in the coming two days to see a copy of this recording and recording of the meeting that we have this morning. And of course, we remain at your disposal. If you've got any questions, you can follow up with myself or with Yi. And once again, thank you to Diane and our panelists and to Yi for today's webinar. So wherever you are in the world, I wish you a great afternoon, great day, and hopefully you will stay safe and if possible, sane as we get through this crisis. Thank you very much and good afternoon.